to introduce to the stage George Miller. and so on and he helped raise the money mm. um, and it was it was fantastic and we were lifelong friends uh, unfortunately he passed away six years ago but he was he was the guy who who just kept this our whole year together every reunion he was the one on the phones on the emails bringing everyone together 
So, and you know, we made a lot of friends at school, but uh, you know, when you when you really bond with someone, it's 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 very powerful. So back in those days in the 1960s, when you're at Sydney High, what were your main activities? What did you do? Well, the thing I most remember, it's, it's strange and it's probably quite different today, but the thing I most remember was the play and the repartee. Uh, we had a lot of wit, witty people around. Uh, and even the quiet guys, when you really got to talk to them, were very, very interesting. I don't remember that, you know, it didn't feel like we studied hard at all, but there was a hell of a lot of play. Um, you know, on the school buses. And it was an interesting school because it drew from so many different quarters of the city. And that was, that was very, very influential because there's so much cultural mix uh, that uh, you, you know, if you, it was like a, a microcosm uh, of, of the city. And, and that was the thing I most remember, the personalities. And, Looking back on it, um, you know, people did really well. Mm. For the most part, uh, you know, virtually everyone in my year became a doctor or a lawyer. Um, and that physicist, you know, the doctor of the school, Ian Nichols, was a leading physicist. Um, and then at one point he said, he studied, went as far as he could go in Australia. One, one day he said, I'm going to Spain to learn flamenco guitar. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, we lost track of him. Mm. So, so you, like so many of your colleagues um, at Sydney High, um, did well enough to, to study medicine at university. Um, why did you do that? Weren't there two sides of your brain? You obviously had a creative streak. There would have been the science and all the other things that would have been necessary to study medicine and become a doctor. Um, what, what was going on and, and what led to your decision? Well, it's, it's um, at the time, um, you know, being the son of migrant parents, my father went to school for one year of his life and education was really important. And at the time, I, um, you know, I, I'd always wanted to be a doctor. We're growing up in a country town, the most influential and seemingly the most magical person uh, in the town was the local doctor um, and and so and also I was intensely curious about who we are as human beings and I believe a medical education is probably for me at least was the best way to get to understand who we are um, I was mainly driven by curiosity uh, I'd had Creativity, but that was always recreational. So I used to paint a lot. I used to draw a lot, um, but that was that was not main the mainstream uh, thing. And there was no opportunity uh, at that time to do anything. So it was the, the main the main the main artistic influence I, I, you know I was exposed to. Were, there was a, a, lo a lot of uh, kids who were from the eastern suburbs whose parents were mainly Holocaust survivors and very educated Jewish families who understood collection of art and so on. And the discourse I began to have with them even at school was very interesting. And if you went to their house, even though their house might be modest, art was really important. Mm -hmm. So I was exposed to that, as just as I was, you know, to South Rugby and, uh, you know, League and everything else. In this, in, in this polyglot school. Uh, the, key, the key, I think, though, is I don't think there is a difference, and I think the big mistake that at least I was making is that it was an either-or. Um, the one thing I've discovered is that you cannot be, if you like, scientific or technical unless you're also highly creative. And you cannot be highly creative unless you're highly scientific and an analytical. And, you know, there are those that argue, I'm a big su subscriber to the idea that the greatest works of art are indeed is 20th century physics. Uh, they've elucidated the world <coughs> more than all the great wor works of art. 
And, and you know, particularly when you do animations, you're working with, you know, up to a thousand people. All, some of them are just, you know, elite level mathematicians writing code. Uh, and in these companies like Pixar and ILM and so on, there was a tendency to divide creatives and technicals and until the pennies dropped, is that each is just another side of the, of, 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 you know, and, and so when, you know, when we made these things, I said, I do not want to hear anyone talk about themselves as being creative or technical. You are, must be both to do your job, to do your job well. It seems an incredibly short time that in 1972 you're at St Vincent's Hospital and in 1977 you're making your first major film. It's such a short time. Is there, was there a particular trigger? Did it evolve in such a short time? It, 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 I, I realised that in life um, you, uh, you know, the, it, the person who said it best was John Lennon, life is what happens when you're making other plans. Mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly what happened. But look, in hindsight, I realised that my filmmaking started when I was a child. I didn't have camera, but you, 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 you kind of um, serve an invisible apprenticeship as a child in your play, in your thinking, in your ruminations, in your fantasies, in your, in, and, and the way you express them in the world. As I said, I did drawing and painting and a lot of building, and the way you interact with people. And um, so by the time I got to university, you know, I was really lucky. I, I got, I was at New South Wales Uni at a time when they insisted that you, you do a, a humanity. And I went to NIDA to once a week. I did philosophy. I went to architecture lectures. I, 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 I used university as an idea playground. Um, and we were free to do it, do it then. Uh, and I learned more in the lecture by Buckminster Fuller at, 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 in 1967, 69, I can't remember, when he came, a great, look him up, he's a brilliant, brilliant thinker. And, um, and I learned more in a two hour architecture lecture than I did in virtually all of my medical studies in terms of how to proceed forward in life. Right. So, so I'm what I'm trying to say is that it's, it, it's um, I'm not answering your question, but, the, right. the, the, but the, the answer is I, it was always there and I just followed a kind of instinct and I never intended, I, you know, people talk about being goal oriented. You, you can't really be too goal oriented because life is, reality is always going to hit you in the face. So I just followed my curiosity. Yeah. I never, ever intended to be a filmmaker. I just wanted to see what it was like to make films. Yeah. And it just happened that I was successful. I was, there was no such thing as a career. Just as in medicine, it's more mapped out. But even if you if you're intend to do medicine, or those, those of you who are doctors, uh, you know that there's no real path you can set out. You've, you do the best you can, you deal with what's in front of you, and you see where it takes you, and you try to use your best judgment as to, as to what, is, what, what on a balance is the best place to go. So that's how I became a filmmaker. And yeah. I was registered as a doctor right, you know, for, for 20 years, because I still thought I'd go back to medicine. Joseph, how are we going with questions from the floor? Well, the questions all seem to be fairly career-driven. Everybody um, is looking for advice. For a young person starting off in quite a number of areas related to the motion picture industry. So there's someone who wants to be a set or costume designer. There's someone who wants to be a film director, um, a filmmaker, and an actor. So that, that's the list of career options people are looking for advice in? It, it, it's very, um, very hard to give you a very clear answer of those who, who are interested in, in, in that sort of career. Um, uh, but the, probably the simplest 
answer which catches it all is go out and make films. Now, you can make a film on your iPhone. You can make, you, even if you don't have an iPhone, you can make a film, you can borrow one. So there's nothing stopping you making films. And not only that, you now have portals by which you can show your films. You, you've, you've seen Vine, you can make a six second film. You can put, do stuff, I don't know if people know Natalie Tran, who does her work um, out of her bedroom, has, has more viewers out of a Sydney bedroom uh, than people who saw Titanic. That's over a billion people has seen her work out of her bedroom. So there's nothing to stop you. And the great thing about filmmaking is that all working in media is it's utterly comprehensive. And that's one of the things I learned from Buck, Buckminster Fuller. It covers every dimension. So if you're interested in costume design or sound or music or the written word or, or any stunts or technical stuff, cameras, if you're a mathematician and you want to write code, it all is used in the process of filmmaking, which ultimately is just another way of communicating story. So there's nothing in the way. If you want to be a really famous and rich Hollywood filmmaker, well, that's another path and that's for the people in Hollywood. But you know, there's ways there too. But that's not the main way. The best way by far is to go out and make a film. And the world will tell you if they're interested in what you've got to say. George, you started making movies in the 20th century. We're now well into the 21st century. Have you worked out 21st century storytelling? It's a very, very interesting debate, uh, and it's changing, changing rapidly. Um, the one constant is, is that we are somehow hardwired for story. That even if, you know, if we were sitting around here and there's in, 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 in you know, pre, prehistoric time, uh, we would be telling stories. And we know people tell their stories by their very early art, by their very early lit ritual. Uh, and we know from indigenous culture here that stories go back you know, at least 40,000 years and probably 70,000 years. But it's an oral culture and, 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 and visual as well, as you know from their paintings and so on. So we know it's in us, and we know those stories transcend time and space. So that, that's always going to be there. The only thing that changes is the medium of delivery. Mm. Joseph, have you got any more to, um, to pass on? Well, there seems to be a lot of concern about how you balance medicine with filmmaking, but I'm... <laughs> ba to balance. How do you balance medicine with filmmaking? They, they oh, seem to be very concerned about oh, that. Oh, I just want to make it really clear, I do not practice medicine anymore. <laughs> uh, I, I did, I, I, as I said, I, I do have a twin brother and we went through medical school together and he's still practicing and he's a very, very good and, and, and uh, you know, very conscientious doctor. And as time went on, I saw how far I drifted away from the knowledge. I mean, you know, if something terrible happened here right now, I could probably help a little bit. But, uh, but I know, uh, you can't. I, you know, there have been people who've tried. Uh, writers have tended to, you know, novelists have tended to balance medicine and, 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 uh, and, and, and writing. Uh, the opera theatre director, uh, Jonathan Miller uh, still practices, I think, or uh, probably not now, but practiced for, as a, I think, a neurologist for a long time uh, while he was still doing stuff. Did he start off in Monty Python, Jonathan Miller? Um, Don't recall. But they're, you know, but they're not, you, you can't really, the, the, you know, particularly directing and producing films is, uh, it, it, it's very full on. It's, it's more, more, more a military exercise than anything else. Of course, there was a time in the 60s and 70s where uh, rugby league players, first grade rugby league players, were also practicing doctors. Yeah. 
Well, I, I think half the wallabies one particular year were doctors and lawyers. Mm. Uh, mm. And then, yeah, several, uh, you know, George Papernus. Yes. Um, who was the, who's that wonderful uh, QC who played for Ryan, played yeah. for Canterbury? Yeah. Um, uh, he was a QC. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, mm. Yes, there's been a number. Now, um, there are tangible markers of your success, and the most well-known one, of course, is you won an Academy Award um, with Happy Feet, and you've had plenty of box office hits, um, and hopefully another coming very soon. Um, now, that's just a very, very small handful, but how do you measure success, and is success important to you? I, I, to be honest, I don't even think, I really honestly don't think much of success. It was strange to be asked to come to a high achiever because I don't think of, I don't even think in terms of achievement. I, you know, I do differentiate bet between achievement and accomplishment. You accomplish something by doing and, and you master something. And if you do that, all the rest will accrue. Um, the, you know, winning awards and things like that, uh, honestly, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I, I feel much more a, a sense of satisfaction out of, you know, say, making a halfway good film that wins an Academy Award than actually winning an Academy Award, even though it's a, it's a good excuse to party. Uh, that's all you get from it, but the actual sense of accomplishment by, yes, I've, I've never made an animation before, but I'm going to go out and do one because I always loved animation, and, and, th and, and to sit back and see that film there with all its, uh, the things that worked and all the things that failed uh, is, is the satisfaction, and I think that applies. I think you ask anybody here, I think they'd all agree with that. Um, uh, that, that, you know, some people, you know, I, 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 one of the things I've noticed in life with people who make a lot of money, but they make the money from something that's not tangible, uh, they then try to um, affirm themselves by, by excess and, 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 and money. Um, but you know, in the old days, when you, when a cobbler made his shoes, he'd put them in the window and people could see the effort of his labor. I remember when we went, the first IVF clinic at Royal Women's when it was at Paddington. I remember being there and on the walls, hundreds and hundreds of baby pictures. And these were all the babies that were helped at the fertility clinic. And that was, the, that was the measure of the success of their labour. It wasn't measured in, 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 in those sort of physical, uh, you know, acquiring that sort of stuff. So uh, th I think, uh, yeah, so, that's, so the measure is, is what, what you leave behind, what you've, what, what you've accomplished, and I think inside uh, feeling that you have had some little bit of mastery over something. And the one thing I've noticed with all successful people um, and, you know, in, 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 in the world that I, uh, you know, have worked in, uh, I've known a lot of very successful f uh, people um, and the and it's always that sense of curiosity and striving and mastery, and what's really interesting is if you master one area, you're more likely to extrapolate that into another area. And it's what I was trying to say before about, you know, people say, well, how can you go from being a doctor to a filmmaker? What's, it doesn't connect. Well, the fact that I went through whole processes of problem solving in one area, you know, even today, I'm using some of those processing to solve other problems and, and vice versa. So those people who, you know, if you can master an instrument, if you can master a physical sporting skill, if you, if, you know, it's, it's no coincidence that 
that you know rugby league players were you know successful rugby league players were also fine doctors because they were able to extrapolate from one discipline to the other and it's going to be way 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 more important for you guys going out into the world you know the 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 you don't know ultimately i would guess that none of you can predict where you will be in 20 years time in terms of what you're doing and probably a lot of you might not we'd be, will be doing jobs that don't exist today mm. so you learn to master something and then keep alert and agile and try to recognize the patterns out there in the world and then you can adapt because if you can't adapt you won't survive sounds like i'm giving a lecture well george it sounds to me It sounds to me that you've given the advice that the boys were seeking when uh, Joseph um, passed yeah, on yeah, those so questions, so I'm sure they'll be very grateful. I think we need to pause now um, so that we can move on to our next panel. So uh, one final um, rousing thank you for George Miller for, for coming here. He may have a little bit of time to stay. We'll just see how we go. Thank you very much.